Well, folks, welcome to the Hump Day Hanger Presentations, sponsored by SuperCup.org and the Not So Straight and Level Podcast. I frankly don't remember what number this is. It's like number 14 or something like that. I'd have to look it up. But I want to thank all of our supporting members of SuperCup.org and our advertisers for making these presentations possible. Without them and without you, we couldn't do it. Uh, many thanks to the presenters that have done these, and thanks to Ted tonight. And, uh, and also thanks you in the audience for uh, coming and watching these presentations and sharing them with other people. It's, uh, we, we really do appreciate that. So, um, again, don't forget to share these with your friends. You can send the YouTube link around. Uh, if you, you subscribe or ask them to subscribe, it makes it really easy for them to be reminded of when we're doing another one. So next week, uh, our own Dr. Randy Korfman will be here to talk about the basic med and third-class medicals and why you should carry both as a pilot. Uh, he'll be answering all kinds of medical questions and things like that as well. If you haven't heard him talk on the subject before, it is very informative and usually a little humorous as well. So, uh, and that was not a medical joke, humorous. That was not a medical joke. Um, so uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Remember that uh, during this presentation, uh, there's time for questions you can use. If you're watching on Zoom, you can use the chat box. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can use the little YouTube chat over there and ask questions. And um, you know, feel free to ask. Uh, I will just sort of moderate the questions. If it looks like something I should interrupt Ted with, I will do it. Uh, but uh, we we'll, may save until the end of the uh, program as well, too. So many of you saw Ted Waltman's first TED Talk on uh, different routes to Alaska. And if you missed that one, you can always go back and watch it on YouTube as we save all of these. It's in the uh, Hump Day Hanger Presentations playlist if you search for that. We're really privileged to have Ted back this evening to talk about flying in and around the Rangels. Uh, Ted created the Fly2AK website. That's fly2ak.com website. Uh, it's a fantastic resource for any pilot thinking about going to Alaska. And after you see this presentation, you'll be thinking about going to Alaska. Welcome, Ted Walt. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I uh, really appreciate the introduction. Look forward to, uh, to showing you what I think is one of the prettiest areas in the entire world. It's certainly the largest protected World Heritage uh, site, uh, 38,000 plus square miles. So with that, let's get started. I'll uh, share my screen if I can figure this out here. And um, I think we should be good, correct, Steve? You figured it out. Outstanding. So let's talk about Wrangell St. Elias National Park and flying in that area. Um, there we go. So a couple of quotes from Paul Claus and Ultima Thule Lodge, well, true wilderness has to have an element of unpredictability and Logan life-changing wilderness. I can assure you flying around this area is mind boggling. The, the scenery is just breathtaking. The superlatives, the adjectives just don't exist to adequately describe everything you see. Um, Ellie Claus, Ellie Gray now, I believe, good to know wild places still exist. And you can look at her beyond her wilderness. It's only about a three minute video on YouTube. Search on uh, that title, <clears throat> highly recommended. But really briefly, Wrangell St. Elias National Park, largest park in the US. You've also got Kalani National Park in Canada, Katanshini Park, and then uh, Glacier Bay down here off the, the map. Once again, the largest World Heritage Area um, protected area in the world, not planet Earth. This is, this is the town of McCarthy, which only has maybe 20 residents in the region in the wintertime, maybe up as many as 500 on a, on a summer where we have typical tourism numbers. And you can see the, the main airstrip is just a short walk or about a mile up the road and around uh, outside of town there. But tonight what we're going to do, Wrangell Mountain Air, I had the privilege of um, flying for them last summer as a part 135 uh, Bush and charter pilot. It offers four different types of sightsees, a, a short one, a 50 minute, which goes up here and around, 70 minute, which gets you a little bit further afield, 
90 and a 120 over into the Bagley ice field. Just real briefly, we're going to go through all of those and give you a virtual experience of flying with us or flying with me as I've done a variety of these tours many times. <clears throat> and, and you'll get an idea of what you can do if, with your own plane up there or if you're playing tourists and flew up on the airline and find yourself in McCarthy. It's well worth your time and money to take one of these tours of Wrangell Mountain Air. It's just the only way to see the park. It's truly the only way to see the park. Ultimate Tully Lodge, just by way of reference, is right here uh, under McCall Ridge. Uh, they have a wonderful website. Uh, Paul Claus did a talk here, as Steve mentioned uh, in one of our earlier presentations. So on the airfield, there's always wildlife. Here's a, a moose, baby moose. We're always, as we practice, that we're always practicing aborted takeoffs. There's all kinds of wildlife up there that you don't see in the lower 48 that you have to be careful of. Here's certainly one of them. <laughs> um, I saw this in the REI store in Anchorage and just started laughing that uh, they have that up there. But at any rate, when you take off from the airport there at McCarthy, the first thing you do is you cross over um, the Kennecott Glacier. Where else in the world can you take off and your radio call is uh, McCarthy traffic, Cessna 273, departing northbound, left turn out down Glacier. Uh, where do you else are you going to mention Glacier in your radio call? <clears throat> the interesting thing that you find, everybody says, well, look, look at all this dirt. Well, that's not actually dirt. It's ice covered by maybe a foot or two of dirt. What happens is as the glaciers come down from the mountains and melt, of course, uh, as they come downstream, uh, they've ground all this material on, along the path of the rock and, and debris that perhaps avalanche down as well. And at some point, the rock is sitting on top of the glacier here. So this is all ice. And uh, well, you can't really see it in this picture. Like you can see some parts of white there, but it's all ice underneath that. Once again, here's the town of McCarthy and the main airstrip, which is about uh, 3,500 feet long, if I recall correctly. This is the original airstrip built in 1920 uh, at McCarthy. This was built in the 60s, I believe, by the state. Um, a lot of private land over here on the west side. And again, the Kennecott Glacier over here. So we're departing on our first tour. We're going to do a 50 minute tour. Uh, that's what it's called. I'm not going to spend 50 minutes on it here tonight. Another interesting feature, you're only going to see this in three areas in the world, Wrangell St. Elias, uh, the Himalayas, and Patagonia in Argentina, Chile. There's actually rock glaciers. This is the Sourdough Peak Rock Glacier. And a rock glacier it is 90% rock, 10% ice, I like to say. Whereas, of course, the Kennecott Glacier and the glaciers you and I are all familiar with is typically 90% ice, 10% rock. So just the opposite. But these rock glaciers move all just like a regular ice glacier, albeit slower. Um, but this one actually was on the cover of National Geographic maybe 20 years ago. And if you Google the Sourdough Peak Rock Glacier, there's a ton of really pretty pictures in the fall. I mean, this is all turned uh, to uh, yellow with the trees. Just gorgeous. <clears throat> Here's another rock glacier that you'd see in the area. You can see the, the, the slow moving lines as they creep very, very slowly down the, uh, the mountainside. But they're all over the place and super interesting. Another one over here. This is the Nazina River. There was a bridge that they built to access the gold mines uh, that are still active at Dan Creek, some small placer mines, and at Chitutu, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. There was another active mining area that's not active anymore. This bridge was built in 1920. It would, it would wash out every year with the, the floods of the Nazina River. And finally, in 1960, it washed out for the last time, and they never finished it because there just wasn't enough justification uh, to keep it going. <clears throat> in the wintertime, they, they uh, use uh, tracked vehicles to haul some, uh, supplies out to the gold mine. Now we're heading up the Nazina Valley. Uh, this is called Mile High Cliffs. Mile High Cliffs because it's almost a mile high. 
this area and the rock patterns and formations, as we'll see in a couple slides later on, are just amazing. Uh, a, a hugely interesting study in geology in this valley. Just a broad, um, couple mile wide, maybe, I don't know how long it is, I guess I never measured, maybe 20 mile long valley, really broad glacial valley. <clears throat> um, one thing we have in the area, and I want to take a little bit of a segue here for just a moment, is we have these plants in the area that are called dryas, and it's an Arctic plant found all over the world in the Arctic regions. Very fragile. Um, when the wind blows, it's like cottonwood uh, blowing in the air. You would think it would be cottonwood from in this part of the United States, but up here it's it's this very fragile ecosystem dryas plant. What's happened in the Nazina River, this is looking up the river, and this is the Mile High Cliffs we just discussed a moment ago, <clears throat> with all these uh, meandering bra braided rivers, and we call them braided rivers because the, the main river channel weaves back and forth, back and forth, and every year forms new sandbars on new channels. Uh, so the main channel might be over here this, this year, might be over there next year. What happens, unfortunately, is pilots need to respect the wilderness a little bit more in terms of this being a national park. This isn't just a uh, BLM land in Utah, perhaps, that's still valuable and still wilderness and should be respected, but this is even more so with in terms of being a national park. What's happened is pilots are, are coming up into this area and instead of landing on the plenty long enough gravel bars that that are eroded every year and change because of the course of the water, they're landing over here in these driest covered areas, once again, that Arctic plant. I've highlighted here some strips that have been created just this summer that really aren't necessary in terms of there's other airstrips that are long established. I'll show you one here in just a moment that are a few miles up the valley or land here in the natural gravel bar itself that's going to, the water will erode uh, next year. But out in here where the plant is growing, again, just like the Recreational Aircraft Foundation and many good land stewards say, this is protected wilderness. Let's, let's treat it with the ultimate respect and if there's, if there's a strip up the valley, let's not create four new ones. And there's actually probably six or eight in, that are I don't have in this picture. Let's respect the wilderness. And here's, here's what I'm talking about. You can see this is a new strip, uh, a new landing spot this year, <clears throat> right in the middle of the driest. No reason for this. It really isn't. That's not going to go away. That's going to be there for 10, 20, 30 years. It really is. Just like a cryptobiotic soil in the desert that we're all cautioned to be careful of when we're out in the Utah area. Same thing here. Just be careful, please. This is some of the rock strata um, in the Mile High Cliffs. Just an amazing study of geology. Of course, this is in the fall, but looking at the, the rock fold, just awesome scenery. Just pinch yourself when you're flying by this with your mouth hanging open going, my goodness, just so pretty. One of the waterfalls that's in the, in the Zena Valley, there's three or four of them. Last year was a pretty low year for water, so they were only really running uh, until perhaps mid-June, into June, and then dried up. But in the average year, these would go all summer. Very pretty to see these waterfalls. And again, there's, there's gravel bars here that you can land on that aren't uh, driest, uh, that are going uh, to stay that way. This is looking up, still flying along the Nazina, going this direction, left to right. This is looking back towards Regal Peak, which we're at an altitude here of maybe 3,000 feet. And Regal Peak is 13,845. Gives you an idea of the tremendous vertical relief in this area. Just awesome glaciated uh, relief. 
quick story. Uh, you got to be careful when you're hiking and crossing these streams. Just two years ago, somebody drowned, got swept away by the creek here, trying to cross when they were doing a backpacking trip. So it might not look dangerous, but it is. You got to be careful. This is at the head of the Nazina Valley. This is Nazina Lake. And there's a landing strip over here I'm going to show you in the next slide. Hey, Ted. Sure. Steve? You mentioned you had a fan running. Yeah. Can you switch that off? Uh, some people said it sounds a little bit muted, and that might be what's causing it. Let's try that. Let's see if that gets a little better. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for letting me know. So again, this is Nazina Lake. Uh, icebergs are cool. We'll land sometimes over at this strip. We'll walk down to the shore here, grab some iceberg ice, and take it back for cocktails in the evening. Always a good time. This is the Nazina Strip. It's used by Wrangell Mountain Air and other pilots as a drop-off point for hikes and for day trips and for raft trips uh, that start at the head of the uh, Nazina River. And it gives you an idea of the type of back established, I should say, backcountry strip throughout the park. It's certainly suitable for uh, a large tire nose wheel plane, but everyone I've ever seen come in here has always been with a tailwheel of some sort. But it, it's not big rocks, but it's, it's not uh, baby smooth either. Mm -hmm. Another view of Regal Peak. I mentioned that just a few minutes ago. 13845, uh, an evening flight here. Just the scenery is stupendous. I don't know how you describe it. Crazy, beautiful. As we fly uh, up the Nazina, so the Nazina Strip is just down here a few miles, the bottom right hand corner. This is the Regal Glacier. And this is called Chimney Peak, as you might have guessed, perhaps, or Chimney Mountain, I should say. That's 7,500 feet, 7,450, to give you an idea of height. But there's actually, at the top of that, I've been told, uh, a whole layer of marine fossils that are just really incredible. Very interesting to see for the few people that have taken the time to hike up there. This is the uh, Regal Icefall uh, coming out of the West Fork of the Regal Valley there. And these bands, I mentioned those in my previous slideshow, I believe. These bands are called O-Gives, or O-G-I-V-E-S. They're, they're like growth rings on a tree. They illustrate <clears throat> the uh, how much the glaciers traveled in a given year. So every band is one year's glacial travel. You don't see these in every glacier. You only see these coming off an ice fall for reasons that scientists can't explain, but that's the only time you're gonna see these banded uh, glacial patterns called ogives. Continuing on on the 50 minute tour, we come over the stairway ice fall. This is actually the second highest uh, ice fall on planet earth. The highest one is the Kumbu ice fall off of Mount Everest. But uh, once again, you can see these O-drives starting to form, pardon me, down here, the bands, over 6,000 feet. And to my knowledge, no one's ever been up this because, pardon me, it's just too crevassed, of course. You, you'd, you'd never be able to, as a climber, mountaineer, skier, be able to make it up through here. You'd spend years going back and forth getting around the crevasses. Continuing, so that stairway ice fall is the other side of these these peaks over here, we've flown over them, and now we've come into what's called the Gates Glacier. And this is the Kennecott Glacier down here. And I'll talk some more about these features in Pack Saddle Island. But this is Pack Saddle Island, I believe. A beautiful evening flight that I took with a, a doctor out of uh, Northeast Canada. So as we pass the Gates Glacier, which is now is on your top or to your right, one of the strips that we dropped hikers off on is called the Foss. Gary Green, a, a charter pilot out of uh, McCarthy, found or, or 
what, what's the word I'm looking for, established this strip, so to speak, uh, long ago. And there you get an idea on, on relatively short final when I was coming in one night in my Super Cub of what the approach into the FOSS looks like. <clears throat> and here's the FOSS strip. This is pretty, uh, pretty interesting strip. Obviously a curve landing, curve takeoff. Uh, if you don't have a good climb out rate for a Super Cub, it's no big deal taking off this direction, but it's actually rising terrain here with this glacial moraine that comes down. So this is not a ground effect to take off downhill. You actually have to, if you, if you have any sort of a wind, you got to take off uphill. Um, and here's that same area after taking off, I circled back around and this is the Kennecott Glacier. Coming back down towards McCarthy and the end of our, or, or towards the end, I should say, perhaps of our 50 minute flight sea, we pass over the uh, Donahoe Lakes. Donahoe Peak is up here on top. And this is the Donahoe Strip, not really used anymore. It's just too short. It's only maybe a couple hundred feet from where it starts getting super rough. And if you're by yourself like I was, it's impossible to turn around. Uh, so you kind of got to stop here unless you're going to push your plane back. But this is um, having landed there and you can see it's you're just not going to turn around through this stuff. So that was an interesting takeoff. <laughs> and again, looking up upstream towards the Kennecott Glacier. This is the Root Glacier, and there's some people in this picture. You can see the people here. The um, St. Elias Guides, and uh, there's another guide group, I forget the name, pardon me. <clears throat> they take people on uh, guided hikes on the glacier. You can walk out onto the glacier, spend uh, half a day or good portion of the day walking around. It's all solid ice, no danger of crevasse falls. You don't have to be roped up. And there's a couple pools over here. <clears throat> the really brave can jump into the pool and then you get uh, a t-shirt or something back at the, uh, the guide shack for having done that. But that water literally is 32 degrees. I never did that. But it's always interesting to show people the, uh, the when we're flight seeing uh, the, how little the uh, folks down on the glacier are. So that was the 50 minute tour. We came around here up the Mazina Valley. Mazina Lake was there. We came up, uh, looked at the West Fork of the uh, Regal here, came across, looked at the stairway icefall in here, the Kennecott Glacier, the Foss Strip coming down here. Actually, we curved over in here. This is the toe of the Root Glacier where the people were. And now back in McCarthy. So now we're gonna do a uh, 70 minute tour, which takes us initially on the same way, but up the Chittistone River, where there was actually some additional copper mining. I should mention, if you're not already familiar, perhaps, pardon me, the McCarthy area was founded basically in the uh, 1908 time frame uh, when they discovered 70% plus rich copper veins up in the, uh, up in the ridge here. So there was actually some copper discovered over in this area, a little bit of gold. Up the Chittistone, Russell Glacier, well, I'll show you some pictures of that, White River, uh, back around through the Seven Sisters. So that's, that's the tour we're gonna do now. Backing up just one second, as we take off on that tour, we pass over some additional strip that's marked on the charts. May Creek is shown on your aeronautical charts. This is May Creek, and you can see a cabin, just barely make out the cabin there. Uh, hunters, hikers, people from all of uh, the flying with their private planes, you can stay in the cabin. The sparsely appointed with an outhouse, but nonetheless, a uh, roof over your head. Pretty long strip. We'd go practice there when we did emergency landings and spot landings and everything else on our 135 checkouts. And this is what the strip looks like from the ground. Again, it, it's not baby smooth, but, you know, it's certainly a... a Certainly fine for a relatively big tire, uh, six by eight and a half at least, a nose wheel plane or any, of course, tail wheel plane. Plenty long enough. And this is, remember that uh, sourdough rock glacier? It once again kind of orients you to that uh, feature across the valley that we saw earlier. 
as you go up the Chittistone Valley, one of the strips that we drop people off on for hikes is called Wolverine. Because apparently somebody saw a Wolverine up there at some point. Um, this is actually Nicole, Nikolai Pass, though, pardon me. <clears throat> we have two different ways we can get to the Chittistone. One is to go over Nikolai Pass, the other one is to come up the Mazina River. So this is actually Nikolai Pass. And if you're up on Nikolai Pass, it's just an awesome view down into the Mazina River. I showed you that view earlier. The Mazina River where we flew up this way to the Mazina Glacier. Here's some big or some uh, dull sheep down here. And you're about 4,000 feet above the uh, the Nazina River. So on the right day, you're not going to land up here with any kind of wind. But if on the right day, it's just an incredible view. What an awesome place. This is the West Fork of the Regal here. And there's a little fuzzy but close up view of the sheep. Back up at the Chittistone River, there's some YouTube videos out there of folks landing. This is Wolverine. Um, and it, you can see that once people land in some of these areas, the alpine tundra or the driest, those tracks stay forever. So certainly with Wrangell Mountain Air, we only used established landing strips that had been there for years and years and years and years and years. Um, ones that are typically on the charts, ones that are certainly in the hiking guides for point to point hikes of which there's several books been published. Um, but get dropped off here. Oftentimes there's sheep up in this area over in here or down to the left. Very interesting to see some of the sheep as we fly by. And this is just simply another view up the Chittistone Valley. This is Chittistone Pass up here that we're going to head up to. And uh, there's a couple strips on the chart that are back this way on your aeronautical chart. Um, Glacier Creek is one and Peavine is another. But they're on the charts. This is Chittistone Falls, really pretty waterfall. Not the best picture, but gives you an idea of some of the scenery as, as we fly along and point these things out to people. This is coming up to uh, Chittistone Pass. You think it's almost winter time, but this is maybe mid-August when we had a cold spell and you get some some snow fairly down low. I don't know if you can hear the ice cream, ice cream truck in the background from outside there. But uh, at any rate, uh, Chittistone Pass, a very pretty area. So as we would come up Chittistone Pass, if the weather and winds permitted, um, we would either go, well, I'll show you three different views here, perspectives. This is called the Valley of Seven Sisters because of seven glaciers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, that we would fly through. You come around the other side of this peak, whose name I was going to look up earlier and I forgot. But uh, Valley of Seven Sisters, just a gorgeous view with with these uh, glaciers uh, as we flew right by them. Just unbelievable. So this is in that same area, looking to the right instead of to the left. And this is the Russell Glacier. That's Mount Bona up there. That's 16,600 feet. Uh, another part of the uh, park, the University Range, we're going to show you some pictures of that on another flight sea tour here in a few minutes. But again, the Russell Glacier. And this is, uh, again, the Russell Glacier off to your right. This is the White River, a huge um, braided river valley, many miles across, 50, 60, 70 miles long, just goes on forever. <clears throat> if you I've done this a couple times. When you leave McCarthy and you're headed back down to the lower 48, you need to clear customs. One of the places to do that, of course, is Whitehorse, as covered in my Fly to AK website. You can leave McCarthy, fly up the Chittistone Valley, down the White River around the corner, and then you're pretty much out uh, almost to the, to the Alaskan Highway, which is not too far here in the distance. So it's kind of a shortcut over to the uh, Whitehorse area if you can get through the mountains through Chittistone Pass. Sometimes weather pre precludes that, obviously. This is to the left before we enter into that Valley of Seven Sisters. This is Skoli 
pass, and there's an airstrip that we drop hikers off. In my opinion, School High Pass is just gorgeous, but it's with a with 38,000 square miles of wilderness. Here's an area, in my opinion, that's overutilized. Everybody seems to be going to School High Pass for day trips or for two or three night overnights. Just you know, when you when you get dropped off or when you're going to go for a hike, you're looking for the, as Paul Claus says, the the true wilderness, the element of unpredictability. And to land where there's already 25 people sort of takes that away. But anyway, here's it gives you another idea of the types of strips that you'll buy, you'll you'll fly by, and you go, gee, I wonder what that looks like and what it is. So it's Skull Eye Pass. Continuing on, this is the. Um, Frederica Glacier, I believe, and this is the Rhone Glacier on the north side of the range. Just a beautiful day, gorgeous scenery. The, the, every day, it's just breathtaking. It's, it's hard to describe just everything you can see. Just so amazing. Ted, it might be hard to describe, but these pictures are phenomenal. Well, thank you so very much. I. I I love sharing this uh, Alaska pictures. I love sharing it with people. I'd love to take everyone listening tonight and that watches it later. I'd, I'd love to have you all go on a group trip up there. It's just, they're so pretty. Um, this is Parka Peak, I believe, uh, at the head of the Kennecott Glacier, Gates Glacier. Just, I never get tired of sharing glaciers. Sometimes we would cross over Bonanza Ridge on our, and taking a shortcut of weather or winds didn't let us come over those ridges that I was just showing a moment ago. This is some of the tram towers for, and this is actually the uh, corner station, maybe not quite the right word, but um, of the Bonanza and Jumbo Mine that, that the Kennecott Mill, we'll show you some pictures of that later, where they processed all the ore was down here in the valley. And that's where you can still tour today. The National Park Service has, is restoring those buildings. But then there was tram lines all the way up the hillside. Uh, this area in the fall, I've got some pictures I'll show you later. And there's another tram tower down here, of course, and another one here. Just unbelievable, the colors. This is the Root Glacier, the upper portion of the Root Glacier. Um, the tram towers I was talking about earlier were up here on the top right. And you can see those O drives, the, the tree bands, as I call them, the yearly advances in the glacier. This is Mount Blackburn at the head of the valley. You can see that from downtown McCarthy and from the airstrip. During the summer, there was a fresh avalanche here off one of these seracs, uh, one of these blocks of ice is called a serac, broke off and created a big avalanche down here. So that was sort of some interesting uh, scenery to point out to folks. As long as I'm on it, I'll point out another feature. This is called a medial moraine. You can see a glacier here, of course, a glacier here. When they come together, each individual glacier has a lateral moraine on either side. When they come together, the lateral moraine of this one and the lateral moraine of that one form a medial moraine. So that's what forms these dark bands in these glaciers. So some of these glaciers, you'll see one, two, three, four, five dark bands here. That's because there's five glaciers that have come together at different points, even here at the head of the valley. Here's an incredibly interesting feature. This is called Hidden Lake. What happens during the winter, any water that, that melts in the sunlight or whatever sort of starts to form a, a virtual dam here and it dams the water. So early in May and early in, in throughout June, typically, a lake forms here. What happens at some point during the summer, a random day, of course, all of a sudden this, an ice dam breaks underneath the glacier or melts, I should say, and this lake over the course of a day or two will completely drain. There's an Icelandic term for that called, a, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, forgive me, it's called a yakaloop. So when a yakaloop occurs, this lake drains. Now the rumor has it, the first pilot that sees the lake starting to drain and reports it back in town gets free beer all night long. But I don't think that happened this summer. 
we never got the free beer. But here you can see another picture of the, the lake is now completely drained and now all these icebergs are stranded. Just amazing. And actually going back, if you got dropped off at the Foss, remember that strip I showed you here a little while ago, that's just off to the right here, a few hundred yards. People would get dropped off there and they'd hike along this valley and get picked up at another strip that I'm going to show you a little bit later on the Lackanaw River. So it's probably a three or four day hike. So those, these drop off at one point, pick up at another point, very popular uh, um, backcountry type activities. So this is the Kennecott Glacier. The Foss is up here. Hidden Lake is off to the left, just to give you some orientation. This is the Gates Glacier. This is the Kennecott Glacier. You can see the medial moraine that formed here when the lateral moraine of the Gates Glacier joined with the lateral moraine of the Kennecott Glacier. Um, and this is the La Chapelle Glacier. Not named La Chapelle yet, but La Chapelle was a... a um, PhD researcher on glaciology in the McCarthy area for many, many years, a couple decades, I believe. And there's a, a move afoot trying to get the glacier named after uh, La Chapelle and the, and the Kennecott Glacier coming down from this area. This is Donahoe Lakes, I earlier mentioned that Donahoe Airstrip is, is over in this area. There was some copper exploration over in this. There's little mine exploration holes all over the place looking for copper. But the Donahoe Lakes are here. So that was, uh, with a couple options, the 70-minute tour where we looked at the Russell Glacier, the White River off over to Whitehorse, came along here, Skoli Pass is in this area, and we came back along, Hidden Lake is down in here that I just showed you, so it's sort of an orientation of where things are. Now I'm going to take a bit of a diversion and, and go off from the, the tour here and take you on our, our daily charter flights over to Chitna, which went over this way. So about a 45 minute flight. This is the Chitna River. You would think it's pronounced Chitina, but it's actually Chitna. And Na is the native word for water. So that a lot of the features in this area end in Na. Chitna, Lakana, Cuscalana, etc. Again, you got to watch for moose. I saw a uh, a bear on the runway once and had to abort one takeoff because of a moose on the runway. So you always got to watch. So we're headed over to Chitna. We're going over what's called Fourth of July Pass. It's actually named on your aeronautical charts, but are on the topographic chart, excuse me, not on the aeronautical chart. So I'd always, when I was up there previous to working up there in my just thinking around on my cub, I hear pilots calling 4th of July Pass, and I'm going, well, where's that? It's up here. A rock glacier coming down the valley. Remember, I mentioned those rock glaciers, 90% rock, 10% ice. Landslide coming down onto the west side of the Kennecott Glacier. And up in the Lackanaw Valley, look at these amazing folds of rock. Just incredible, the topography that we would see. Just just amazing. This is the Lackanaw River and the uh, Lackanaw Ridge, excuse me, and the uh, Lackanaw River is on the other side. This uh, landslide, partial rock glacier as well, I believe. Interesting formation though with the different lobes. You'd think you're safe camping in these trees, but oh boy, oh boy, that wake you up. <laughs> As we cross over that ridge, which was on the, uh, to the top right here, you come over and here's an outfitter's camp for uh, sheep and bear hunts in the fall on the Lackanaw River. Uh, <clears throat> very interesting place, very interesting uh, outfitter, super nice folks. And this, would, this is what it looks like. This isn't the landing strip, but this is looking from the edge of the landing strip up that valley. Talk about Unbelievable wilderness, just amazing. Nobody goes up in this area. I mean, you'd be the first humans probably on some of these peaks for sure. Just incredible. And by the way, the tree line here in Colorado, the tree line's about 11,600 feet here in the Wrangell St. Elias range. I believe it's around 3,500 feet. So continuing on, 
um, flying along the Cuscalana Valley over towards Chitna from McCarthy, flying to the west. This is Mount Blackburn again, 16390. And this is this peak here is this is Castle Mountain. I got a picture of that in a second. This is Castle Mountain, Castle Peak, which is 10,000, I think. I'd have to look. But uh, one of our pilots climbed this couloir um, either the fall before or the spring of this last season and had some har harrowing stories of his climb on the Castle Peak here. Beautiful peak, though. And there's always dull sheep. Sorry for the, I don't have a telephoto picture and I'm flying and close to the mountains. So trying to get a quick shot, but there's always doll sheep that we, we would see. Again, almost over to the Chitna area. This is Wrangell Mountain, 14, 310, a little over 14,000 feet. It's the last active volcano in the park. There's actually some steam vents, I believe they're over in this area here. That you can, uh, I flew by once and you could see steam still coming out of that area. Super interesting. This is the Gilahina uh, trestle. Of course, they, they had this copper mine, uh, rich cop, five different or six different rich copper mines in the McCarthy area. You had to get the copper out of there back in the early 1900s. So there's a 197 mile railroad that uh, they built. This was the trestle, wooden trestle. Um, here's a bit of a story. You can you can read that. The funny anecdote is how they how they got them to do this in less than two weeks. They actually built this in less than two weeks. So as the story goes, the superintendent, you know, the work crew was on one end or the other. I forget, probably over on this end, with all the building it as they went along, and he put a barrel of whiskey over here and told them when they got to there, they could have the barrel of whiskey. So that gave them some extra motivation. So that, that's the story behind the Gilahima trestle. <laughs> and here's kind of what it looks like today up close. But super cool to fly over that and see that history. Flying towards Chitna, there's all these unusual lakes. This is called Tooth Lake. Looks like a molar, right? So we call Tooth Lake. This is flying towards Chitna, but from Hidden Lake, remember I showed you that with a Yakaloop. So if you fly up that valley and around towards the Lackanaw and then down to Chitna, this is up in that upper valley. Just gorgeous. I mean, just hiking in this area, another rock glacier here. Just amazing scenery. This was super interesting by Chitna. I'd ask if we had time, but anybody want to venture a guess, I'll tell you the answer. This is a logging area where they logged and different trees grow in, crew in on the logging road. So you'd see these weird checkerboard puzzle-like patterns as you flew over and you go, my goodness, what would cause that? And it's the logging road, different uh, type of trees. Never seen that before anywhere. So here's the Chitna Airport. That logging area is just off the left-hand side of your screen over here. This is the Copper River. The Copper River in the spring, early spring, early summer, actually has more water uh, than the Mississippi River. The, uh, so it's just a prodigious amount of water. There's a bridge right here. This bridge wasn't built until 1971. Um, after the railroad bridge collapsed. So that was probably in 1938, the last time the train ran. So for the period between 38 and 71, you had to take a cable with a little bucket across the river. There was no, or, or a uh, boat or, or a ferry, no way to get across until they built the road here. The town of Chitna, such that it is, is actually around the corner here. So if you landed here to pick up people and had to wait or got stuck for whatever reason, you didn't have cell service. These are like state maintenance buildings, so there's nothing there. So you're just kind of hanging out. But one thing that's super cool on this end of the uh, river here are fish wheels. So native Alaskans and Alaska residents can use a fish wheel. If those of you don't know what a fish wheel is, I'll tell you that in a second. In Chitna, 
This is Tom's Tavern, just a classic bar, old Alaska bar. So I mean, just that's Tom, classic place. And here we were, my buddy and I, pilots, sitting there, George, sitting there having a beer, or not a beer because we had to fly, but uh, cokes. And in walks somebody with fresh salmon and just treated everybody that they just caught some fresh salmon, flayed it and cooked it and treated everybody with free salmon. This is a fish wheel. Uh, I'm sure you perhaps now know what it, so these just rotate with the current endlessly and the fish drop off the chute into a bucket here and in, into this, you know, out into the side. There's probably five or six here. You'd see them running. You'd see a few fish in here, but it wasn't exactly a bump crop by any means, so to speak. But it's kind of interesting, entertaining to walk down there and see one in person if you've never seen them. And each one of these would have a permit number and phone number and all kinds of stuff. So the state does keep a pretty good track of it. So now we're going to the the, the gem of the tours. We're going to go on the two hour sightsee tour uh, down into the Bagley ice field. Perhaps one of the most jaw-dropping, stupendous, again, pardon me, I, I, I should look up 20 more adjectives to uh, use. But as we would walk to work each day, uh, Mary Ellen, uh, Cheryl, uh, I took this picture, just a gorgeous picture one morning, walking to our pilot uh, briefing area. And everywhere in town, as we'd walk either to the airport, it didn't matter where you went, everywhere, there's detritus left over from the mining days, or barrels or rail tracks or cables or just junk all over the place, everywhere. So here we are, we fly up the Tana River Valley, sometimes the Tana Glacier, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. You can see where the, you know, the, the, the ground and the clouds are sort of coming together here. Um, we'd go up as far as we could safely go and still maintain 500 plus feet and be able to be assured to get back uh, and look at the wonderful scenery. Again, these are medial moraines formed further upstream by the glacier. One thing you'd see a lot of is rock slides where the glaciers have melt, you know, the, the temperatures are so warm, things are eroding incredibly fast. The rocks would fall down and, and cascade out onto the glacier. There were some extremely long ones. You can see some of the debris even out into here. This is part of the Bagley Ice Field, 127 miles long, over 3,000 feet thick, literally horizon to horizon. Just a lot of ice cubes. Another uh, rock slide. And again, things were, I was at 10,000 feet in late June. <clears throat> 10,000 feet in late June, it was 70 degrees at 10,000 feet. It ought to be 20 degrees at 10,000 feet. So the temperatures this past year were just crazy warm, crazy warm. And that's why everything was, the rock is really bad rock, very loose rock. If you're a rock climber, you think, oh, wow, I'd love to go climb this or climb that. No, it's all crumbly. Touch it, it comes apart in your hand. So here's the Bagley Ice Field. Here's the Jeffreys Glacier. You can see a medial moraine coming here. This is actually Mount St. Elias, probably another 80 miles away, 18,008, 18,008. <clears throat> Everybody wanted to go see Mount St. Elias. And over here, St. Elias is in the U.S., the border, the summit, the summit, I believe, is on the border of U.S. and Canada. Over here, I'll show you another picture in a minute. This is Mount Logan in Canada, right out, just across the border. That's the highest peak in Canada, second highest peak in North America, 20, 19,970, I think, or something like that. But all this is ice, and this is called the Fern Line, F-I-R-N. It's the line that delineates accumulation zone and the um, melting zone, ablation zone. That's the word I'm looking for. A fern line. So you have fresh snow here, you have just ice here. 
again, the Bagley Ice Field and the Jeffries Glacier coming down into the Tana, eventually Glacier and a medial moraine. Looking towards the Chugach Range over here towards Anchorage on the other end of the Bagley Ice Field. This feature is called a Nunatuck. Um, it's where the top of a peak or mountain just starts poking through the ice. And the glaciology, glaci glacial term for that is Nunatuck. How am I doing on time, Steve? You're doing great. This um, pool is very common throughout the region. We saw one a moment ago, I didn't point it out, but it looks just cobalt to blue. It's actually clear water. The reason it's so blue is because of the reflection, or excuse me, the blue ice underneath. Recall these glaciers are simply snow upon snow upon snow that gets compressed. And as it gets compressed, you see some the blue color, and the compressed color of the ice come through. So you'd see these beautiful blue pools all over the place. Another rock slide coming down the glacier. And again, just really bad rock. From a rock, from a climber's perspective, you're not going to get up these peaks unless you're doing it on snow and ice up some couloir. You're not going to get up it on one of these ridges. It's going to be very dangerous because of how loose this is. And yet another one. You can see where it started up here and just went across the glacier. Just super cool to see all these all over the place. But sad too, in that you realize things are decomposing. So again, the Bagley Ice Field way down into Glacier Bay, down into this area. Mount St. Elias. So on the right day, a clear day like this, we would often, uh, people wanted to see the Bagley Ice Field, Mount St. Elias, and Icy Bay. And we had just enough time with a 206 to be able to, so this is my cub obviously, but in a 206 to get down to Icy Bay and take two quick loops around. Mount Logan, once again, that I mentioned a moment ago, actually in Canada, so we're right on the Canadian border, or close to it, I should say. Probably 20 miles away, 30 miles away here. Some more uh, landslides, avalanches coming off the sides. And out here, you can actually see part of the ocean out in this area. Looking down into these crevasses is just super fascinating. Obviously, if you were if you were hiking or skiing or climbing, you know, you're walking across this area and you think it's just perfectly fine, but in reality, it's just a little bit of snow over a crack like this, a crevasse like that. It's really interesting to see how that works. Some more of those blue pools or moulons. Sometimes if a pool drains into the glacier, it's actually called a, a moulon. This is super cool. Stumbled on this by accident, totally by accident one day. Look at the face in the glacier here. I couldn't believe it. That was <laughs> so cool to see that. And this is just off the Jeffries Glacier. I think I have a close up. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Just, I mean, how could that form? It's just amazing. I, I was just a super cool thing to show people. Once again, down into Icy Bay, I showed you this uh, a few weeks ago. This is the, the, this is the Geo Glacier, G-U-Y-O-T, melting, uh, a lot of water. I've got pictures of this area from 2014, and this is 2019, and the ice in 2014 was down into this area, so it's receded that much just in two or three years. Another view of the waterfalls, Icy Bay. Wow. Actually, la actually, landing strip uh, right here. Here? Um, Tag Eat Point. I think it's right here. I've landed there a couple times. So back, heading back towards McCarthy on the two-hour tour. Again, these blue pools. Just super, super scenic, photogenic. Just you know, wonderful. We cross over the Bagley Ice Field, which is back to the left here, come down Goat Creek. Um, 
and land. Sometimes we would land. Uh, there's a uh, gravel bar strip that we would use here to drop hikers off. This is the upper. This is the end or the head of the Mazina River. Ultima Thule Lodge is down here in this area. McCarthy's around the corner down into that area sort of gives you an orientation of where we're at, but this is just probably three or four, maybe five miles in one or two places wide. Um, Chitna, excuse me, not the Mazina, Chitna Valley up here. Continuing across the Chitna Valley, we'd go up the Hawkins Glacier. This is called the Hawkins Glacier. Uh, Jared sent me this picture today. This is from uh, just a few hours ago, in fact. So you guys are right up to date. I mean, this is current. Uh, <laughs> current conditions. We call this the Bat Cave, and University Peak is just off to the right here, 14,470 feet or something like that. But we'd come in here, and it looks like a pretty tight area, but it's miles wide, and we'd fly right up to the face here, or close, you know, super safe, of course, the entire time, winds permitting, and circle around, come back under here, and then back out the Hawkins Glacier. It's not named the Bat Cave on any charts or maps, but that's just what we called it for our point of reference. This is the Bernard Glacier. The Hawkins Glacier is just off to your left here. The Bernard Glacier, and you can see all these valley glaciers coming down. And this is why you get those broad medial moraines and so many of them, because you got so many glaciers coming together upstream. Just I'll bet nobody's ever been up in here. I mean, I can't even imagine anybody having been up in here. I can't imagine. There's no way. Now, how would you get there? There's no way. Just wilderness, true wilderness. Super cool crevasses. This is, once again, these blocks, these are called seracs, S-E-R-A-C-S, um, seracs. This is uh, not University Peak, but the peak just on in the Bat Cave there to the right after we've circled around and coming out the Bat Cave now. Pretty cool to lift your wing and see that you're below all this glaci glacial um, features. So the Bat Cave is up. This is the Bernard Glacier. This is the Hawkins Glacier. But I believe the Bat Cave is up in this area here. So now we just did the icy bay two hour main Mount St. Elias. Mount Logan is just off the side of the picture here to the right, the head of the Chitna Valley up here where I showed you we dropped off people sometimes for raft trips. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment again. And now we came around, depending on time, we'd cross over McCall Ridge and look at some sheep that were up here, circle around the Sourdough Rock Glacier, and then back into McCarthy. This is a, I'm going to give you an example of some of the Forest Service cabins. This strip is on your charts. Uh, I forget that, the, but it's called Jake's Bar. I think it's AK0, but I'd have to double check that. But it is on the chart. It is on floor four. Um, this is the main runway. Um, this is the taxiway, which I've always landed on. I've never landed on the main runway. Um, this is a little rougher. Or excuse me, this is rougher, I think, than the taxiway, but the taxiway, of course, is much shorter. But there's some cabins right here I'm going to show you in just a minute. Got to be one of my all-time favorite um, spots. A lot of people that would raft the Chitna River would stop here. They'd pull off right here, and they'd spend a night in the cabin or two nights in the cabin. You'd see some people land over here on the gravel bar sometimes, but there's nothing there. So this is short final in, into the uh, taxiway. The main strip, once again, is, is right here. This is the taxiway. Here's the cabin over here. Jake's bar, short final. So there's the, uh, the strip. I've only seen tailwheel planes in here. I can't imagine a nose wheel plane coming in here. Um, it's too, too short for a 206 unless you're super light. But you know, it's a good strip. Tie downs over here. And here's the cabins. This is actually where you can sleep and cook. This is a sauna, a wood fired sauna. I mean, in the middle of the wilderness. How's that? And what's, what's also cool 
is people have respected, thankfully, that they've respected, they've left all these original implements. There's some here, there's some hanging up over here on the other side of the door. There's a whole bunch more traps, um, old axes, et cetera. It's just fascinating, all the old implements from um, the original people in this area. And then the Forest Service cuts wood. So there's even wood for the stove inside the cabin here. Cool, super cool place. Super, super cool place. Well maintained by the Forest Service. I think I got a picture of this window. What everybody does in these remote cabins is when you leave, and in the wintertime, they put a board down here with nails on it. So the bears can't get in the windows and that there's nails sticking up. So if you ever come in one of these places in the winter and there's maybe six, eight inches of snow, you better be looking where you're walking. So we're sitting in there, you know, it's raining, can't see the rain here, and it's not hard. And here's a grizzly bear walks right by the front door of the cabin. Well, they're out there. Boy, was that cool. I was going, holy kid. <laughs> I took the bear spray with me, even going to the outhouse after that. <laughs> <laughs> There's the nails in the window. So just, here's a couple of random pictures. This is another strip not used very often called Steamboat Hills. I hate to see people do this. I, 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 it's really sad. They, uh, they took stones and they made a little runway marker here. So that's, that's really not kosher. It's not used very often, if at all. But it's just too bad people do that type of thing. So please don't do that. Respect the wilderness. Uh, up on top of Steamboat Hills, and here's Mount Blackburn, um, Mount Regal, Parker Peak, or uh, Rhine Peak, excuse me, Rhine Peak, Atna, Atna Peak, and, and Parker Peak, or Parker Peak's here, and this is a Regal Peak here. And McCarthy is right down in here, just the other side. Just no wind, absolutely. Unlimited visibility, incredible day. Some more random pictures. This is actually by McCarthy is way off here to the left. <clears throat> this is the Chugach range. This is the Copper River, sort of gives you an orientation. Gokana, uh, um, I don't know, I'm thinking of Glen Allen and Gokana are over here to the far right. This is the Mount Drum Fumarole, uh, it's a volcanic you know, just like Yellowstone uh, fumarole that uh, hot mud comes down here. Interesting that you would see that in the midst of all these glaciers. And here's part of the Copper River over here. Another area we flew over, we would pick up and drop hikers off. This is Golconda Creek. There's actually a strip here called Bremner. It's on the charts. And this is an area of the Bremner Historic Mining District. There's a couple of volunteer rangers up here all summer long protecting the artifacts. There's a ton of uh, old artifacts in these buildings that are uh, an original Model T still with a glass in it, believe it or not. These wagons, uh, a power plant with still the original gauges, and all pristine pants hanging up from the 1920s that would all be gone, uh, probably, if, if not for the volunteers sort of safeguarding it all summer. Fascinating area. And McCarthy is just uh, down here 20, 30 miles. So I think that, what time we have there, Steve? It is uh, 8.04, Ted. Okay, so I'm gonna pound through about, uh, I'm gonna go through real quick. This is the Valdez Narrows when we would fly over to Valdez during the fishing season. How a salmon gets through here is beyond me. Um, another glacier with the O-Drive features. Ah, here's the trivia question for the night. This is the Alaska pipeline. Anyone want to venture to guess why it meanders like this? Got a guess, Steve? They had a lot of extra elbows that they needed to use. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> it's for earthquakes. So if the land shifts, expansion expansion loops, that's my guess. The expansion for so that it can expand in an earthquake. And, I, and I'm guessing that because somebody typed that in the chat. Ah, there you go. So the winner is foggy fog. There you go. 
just another uh, interesting uh, peak on the way to the uh, volcanic ridges, evidence of volcanic action in the past. This is the Copper River, the, the bridge to nowhere, because this is the old railroad bridge. It doesn't exist, uh, that doesn't. So if you're in Cordova, this is as far as you can drive. The Copper River, sand dunes in the Copper River. This gentleman, Mike, I picked him up. He had never rafted in his entire life. He bought a raft, or rented a raft, bought all the equipment, and he rafted from the headwaters of the Mazina River uh, all the way down, or the Chitna River, all the way down the Copper River, two and a half week trip or something like that. First time he ever rafted in his entire life. What an incredible story. I just thought that was so special. But this is the Copper River. Again, sand dunes. Here's another rock slide that came out into the middle of this glacier. Another Yakaloop, another lake that drained. This is flying over to Anchorage, to Zena Lake, Kaslina Lake, and some fall pictures. I'm just going to go through these fairly quickly. In the fall, it was just crazy beautiful, just insane. Rock Glacier, another rock glacier. I mean, there would be days when I'd pinch myself. I couldn't believe I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> the uh, Donaho Lakes. This is actually the Erie Mine. I, I wish I could show you an overview picture. Maybe two, three people a year get up to this because you have to climb this insane cliff basically that's super hard to get to. And this is the mine portal, one of the, one of the um, copper mines. Kennecott Mill, where they processed all the ore. This is where those tram towers were up the ridge there to the left. Big rock glacier coming down above Kennecott. And McCarthy's just down here about four miles to your right. This is the uh, <coughs> Chittistone or the Mazina Valley. This is the... Uh, uh, drawing a blank. I'll think of it in a second. Um, another one of the copper mines up in the up in the area there. Ah, I'm having a senior moment. Sorry. I'm surprised you remembered as many of these things as you have. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. I'll think of the name of that after I hang up. And this is over towards uh, Mount uh, Blackburn, and this is the ridge going into Lackanaw Valley, Lackanaw Ridge. A lot of the sheep that I pointed out earlier were up in here, Castle Peak up there. Um, and, uh, oh man, I can't think of the name of that. Lackanaw Valley. See, this is that picture I had earlier. This is that corner station. Remember that? It was all green. Here now it's all changed color. This is again a picture of that Erie mine. This is the Erie Lake, which is another Yachaloop. More the pools. This hey, Ted. Part. Yeah. Don't go too fast because it takes a second longer for it to switch for us. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Tell me if I'm going too fast. We, we've, uh, we, we, we've, we're, we've got ourselves programmed now. So. I apologize. That's all good. So this, this actually is the, the lake at the end of the Kennecott Glacier, and McCarthy is only about mm, a mile. So you can have dinner, and after dinner, you could walk out here on this dirt road and walk over to the glacial lake and if you wanted to you can get ice cubes for your uh, evening cocktail just i mean just being right there in the midst of all this glacial activity by the way the kennecott glacier which this is the end of terminal moraine now it reached its maximal extent they think about 1860s based on tr analyzing tree rings in the area so here you can see the dirt on top of the ice. This is all ice here. And you can see the white underneath. Here you can see some of the white. But it's all ice. And see over here, you can see the ice just underneath the band of dirt that's on top. So it's only a meter of rock or a foot or two of rock at the most. But it looks just like all. Some people we'd fly and they say, well, is that all mine tailings? No, that's glacier. Um, it's Donahoe Peak and Regal Peak and Parker Peak. And this, this is about two miles outside of uh, McCarthy. You could walk through this ice tunnel if you were brave enough. I didn't walk through it. A buddy of mine did, Mike. I didn't have the, the guts to do that. 
because I figured, man, this thing's going to collapse when I walk through. And some of the glacial lakes. We'd pick up people. This is on the uh, lower Chitna River. We'd pick up people here that rafted. They'd, they'd stop here and we'd pick them up on day trips on this strip. We'd also do um, check ride, emergency landings into this strip. This is where, uh, this is above the Bonanza Mines over here. The Jumbo Mine is up here. Really cool hikes. I've hiked up to both of those to see all the old detritus that's still up there from the mines. This is the Erie Mine again. Donahoe Lakes. That's that mine, the name I can't think of right now. Ugh. Darn it. Let it go, Ted. McCarthy. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I'll go through these. Any questions? I'm happy. I'll go through these as I answer questions. These are just hiking in the area. So I have a couple of questions. I got a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, which, which, which folks, feel free to use the chat if you have some questions. Um, so, well, first is you're, hard, Steve. You can see the copper ore here. Oh yeah. So you're flying around through all this stuff all the time. Are you thinking about continuously how this engine is running or anything like that? Or you just not even give that a second thought? If you're doing the run over to Chitna, there's places to land. Uh, once you get off into the Bagley in that area, if the engine quits, you'd have a chance on the bare ice areas, but with a nose wheel and even then you're pretty much in trouble. I, I, I didn't really think about it because it didn't do me any good to think about it. <laughs> You know, we had super, super good maintenance, super good mechanics, Steve Sweeney, just an outstanding mechanic and Wrangell Mountaineer, very diligent. I mean, if you mentioned there was a uh, piece of carpet out of alignment, he would fix it that, that evening. Um, just a super good guy. This is the uh, Bonanza Mine. What are, uh, what are any other, that's that corner station. A copper ore up there. This is inside the Bonanza Mine building. I mean, it's amazing how there's the shape this stuff's in. McCarthy's down here. You can see the McCarthy strip right there. Kennecott Glacier. That's that Kennecott Lake with the icebergs in it that I was showing you just a few minutes ago here. Corner Station. This is the uh, Chugach Range. And the Mazina Chitna River down in here. So uh, somebody asks, how were the winds around the mountains? Did it inhibit a lot of flying days? Did it, did it cause a lot of problems for flying days? We only had two days where winds prohibited flying the whole summer. But there were several days where <clears throat> we talked a lot about mountain flying. We briefed it every day. And we were very cognizant of where the prevailing wind was from because you want to be on the upwind side going over the ridge. Um, so we were very aware of it. We're fortunate that we really didn't have any major issues except for two days when we didn't fly period. Um, this is actually a hot water pipe that they'd run all the way down to the mill. Um, so no, the winds weren't really an issue, but we were certainly mindful of it. And we'd give it We'd give it at least 500 feet on a calm day and 1,000 to 1,500 feet if it was blowing more than 5 to 10. How long did you do that? Um, the middle of May was training until the middle of September. So their season is May 15th to September 15th. And then how, how, long did, how, how often did you do it? I've only done it one season. But I've been up there privately flying four times previously. I always wanted to spend a summer in Alaska and this opportunity from a friend of a friend of a friend fell in my lap. And so I took advantage of it. It was just a wonderful time. Wrangell Mountaineer was just a super good group of people. Super, super good group of people. Austin Robo and Diana Tubbs and the whole group, just super group, big people. 
Any other questions? So the other question I have, I, in case somebody else asks anything, but the other question I have is, so have you come up with a calendar yet of your pictures? You need one that's about 20 year calendar probably to have all these pictures. If you had one picture for a month. Uh, There's some, some really great photos, Dan. Well, thank you so very much. And thank everyone who watched this. I'm very thankful and appreciative and sincerely, sincerely means a lot to me to be able to share this with everyone. It really does. It, it's my life dream to share this area with people because it's, to me, it's the prettiest place on the planet. I don't need to go anywhere else. I can go to McCarthy and Wrangell St. Elias National Park and look at the true wilderness of, as Paul Klaus says. Very good. Well, Ted, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I don't know why it's so dark now. But, uh, yeah, well, apparently it got dark in Colorado while you were, uh, no, while you were giving your presentation. Turn the so, light on. I can turn it on. Well, Thank you again, Ted. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, tune in next week when uh, Randy Corfman talks about Pilot Medicals. It's always good. Um, also, remember to, um, uh, if you have some ideas about somebody you'd like to see do a presentation or you want to do one yourself, get in touch with me. And you can see that normal, everyday people can do these things, and uh, they, have done, they have interesting things going on in their lives. Lou Furlong, do you have a question? Did you raise your hand? Okay, excellent. All right, everybody, thanks again, and thank you, Ted. Thank you, folks. See you later.